So if we get, you know, you're kind of paying attention to the beginning of class. And I did not, you didn't hear me say, I started the recording. Someone, you know, raise your hand or just call out, hey, are you recording? Yeah, okay. So let's do attendance for today. So um, this quote comes from George Washington, still in the space of divine providence. To understand this quote, we got to remember that, uh, you know, what's going on in 1755 is the French and Indian War. Strange uh, to say that it's not, uh, it's actually George Washington starts the French and Indian War almost single-handedly. Um, we don't really hear much about you know, his involvement uh, in that particular battle, but he led a, an expedition that ended up killing a French diplomat's brother. And that's really what kind of kicked the whole thing off. Um, and in fact, George Washington doesn't get popular in like England and America until he's like really hated in France. Kind of, you know, once the French hate this guy, the English are like, who is this guy? He must be pretty good. The French hate him. Um, so anyway, um, French Indian War has been going on for a couple of years. It's not going well uh, for, the, um, for the British. In fact, it's not really doing much of anything until they bring over Edward Braddock, old school uh, European general who was going to come to suppress, you know, kind of kick the French out of the British holdings in North America. Uh, and Braddock believes that if you have superiority of numbers and superiority of firepower, you are guaranteed victory on the battlefield. And so he comes into uh, Virginia with uh, superior, he brings his superior firepower, but he's got to recruit people. And so, you know, he starts recruiting men to, to get a superior force. By this time, 1755, Washington thinks he's retired. His military career is over and he's settled into life as a gentleman farmer. But when Braddock shows up, Washington's like, you know, this Braddock's a pretty connected guy. It might be good for me socially to be connected to Braddock. And so he kind of signs up to fight with Braddock. He's retired as a colonel from the Virginia Regiment. He's now um, recommissioned in the British Army as a captain. Anyone like from a military family, is that like a serious reduction in rank or just like a little bit? That's a major reduction in rank, you know, but, but Washington's, you know, glad to do it um, just because he thinks this will be, you know, kind of good for his social standing. He tells Braddock, hey, over here in North America, you really got to pay attention to the geography. And Braddock just kind of dismisses this advice from this uh, colonial captain. Um, uh, they're, where are they going? They're going from Virginia to where? Where are they trying to kick the French out of? Pittsburgh. I mean, today you think Pittsburgh, let him have it. But it's it's really an important place because Pittsburgh is where the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers meet to form the Ohio River. It is like the crossroads on the Western frontier. What is the Western frontier at that time? And uh, they just feel like we've got to, you know, we've got to get the French out of here. In fact, the British were building a fort right there. And before it was done, the French came in and kicked the British out and then they finished the fort. So Fort Duquesne is their, is their target. It is no secret. They are not sneaking up on anyone. They are taking a force of 2000 men they are cutting a road. They're bringing heavy artillery. They are bringing, you know, camp followers. It is a pretty substantial group of folks that are going out there. And they make it within 30 miles of Fort Duquesne when they are ambushed by French and Indians and they are in deep trouble. Braddock, there's 1,800 of those 2,000 men will go into this battle. Uh, Braddock is mortally wounded in the first five minutes, and one by one, the other officers are killed. Washington finds himself as a captain, the, the ranking officer who is overseeing what stands to this day as the worst defeat in British military history. He will organize an orderly retreat, and each of the 400 men who survive that battle uh, on the British side owe their life to George Washington. This is the beginning of the mythology around the man. He will have two horses shot out from under him. He will get four bullet holes in his coat, but he will not be scratched during the battle. In fact, it will be you know, decades later when uh, Washington is president of the United States and the Capitol is still in New York City uh, that, that Indians who were at this battle will come to New York to pay homage to the man who had the protection of the great spirit. And so this mythology is not just like British North American mythology, but it's like American mythology. Anyway, uh, if you're in that kind of a battle and you survive, you should write home to mom pretty quickly and tell her you're okay. And that's what he does here. So after that battle, he says this, God's hand was on me, God protected me and kept me through the battle. 
again, just the founders recognizing the hand of God that is an intervening God, a providential God, this idea of divine providence. All right, close that. And remember, it's not just story time, but you're going to this URL and you're marking down the information that lets me know that you were here today. So I know some of you probably you know, weren't here on Monday, you're just adding the class. So we will do a little discussion like that at the beginning of the class um, so you can let me know that you are here. We'll save that. The other thing you should know is that right here, VBA course, and this is on learning suite, but vba-course.blogspot.com is where you'll be able to get the videos. Now, something's happened. It used to be that I could kind of pre-fill all these dates and they would hold their place, but it looks like as I've updated them, they've kind of moved around. So I have to see if I can figure out how to get these things back in order conveniently. So we're actually going to be on, you know, so here's January 9th from Monday. Here's the video posted. There's no files to download. Um, those would be listed here uh, if they were. So you can always go and watch those videos and whatever. So we're on January 11th today. And so we'll be going over variables. But before we dive into the content for today, any questions, administrative or otherwise? Yes, go ahead. I think on the course, um, the, the online checklist we get, you go to like uh, problems, I guess you could do. There are end of quiz or end of chapter problems, something like that. Are those Oh, yeah. So there's all kinds of stuff in the textbook that we're not using. So, in fact, there's like quizzes and stuff. You're not going to do any of those. So you want to, for, for, for figuring out what you're going to do for this class, Learning Suite is going to be the place that you look. Yeah. So kind of the way that I see it is that uh, like Learning Suite, like the schedule on Learning Suite, this is the place where I'm going to put anything that you need to know about. So this column right here that talks about assignments that are due, that's, that's, that's where you want to keep an eye on what needs to be done. Yeah. Yes? Um, so when I click on those assignments, it says like submit on learning suite. Do you need to submit it to learning suite? Ah, yeah, yeah, this is a good question. Um, thanks for bringing this up. So like if I, if I come here, um, like there's some way to submit here. Can I submit? I'm not sure what this is supposed to look like um, for you, but uh, you, so you probably noticed that like, like when you do the assignment, you submit it like right there inside of the workbook and it submits and it shows you your grade and everything. Now, the, the, the grader, the automatic grader is really good at giving you full credit. Like if, if what you did looks like what it was expecting, it'll give you full credit and that's great. If, if, if what you did didn't do what it's expecting, it might appropriately give you partial credit, but it's really easy to make a tiny mistake that makes the grader think what you did was completely wrong and you get almost no credit with just a tiny mistake in your code. Well, what is that? So what, are you doomed if that happens? Well, no, we have TAs and they'll be, and I'll be glad to look at your work and say, oh yeah, the grader gave you 40% on this, but it looks more like 95% to me. This is one little small mistake. And so the way that you ask for an individual review of your code, like to have a human look over your code is by submitting your workbook to Learning Suite. So you're going to go ahead and you submit it through the grader. And if you're happy with the grade, let it be. But if you think, wait a minute, I think I, think I was abused by the grader, then upload the workbook. And that's the cue for a TA to look over it and kind of go through your code and actually give you a different grade. Be careful. They might give you a lower grade. So I don't know. Usually not, though. It goes on. Uh, okay. So yes, yeah, so good question. Other questions? Yes. So on the schedule, it shows there's a link to report class attendance. We click that or type in the one up there. The it's the same link. Yeah, and it's the same link every day. So make it your favorite for the semester, and then you can just go right there. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and, and it's time sensitive, right? So you've got to actually do it like during class. So if I, put the, if I put the quote up like before class, that's okay. Like a few minutes before class, kind of like through the most of class, that'll be okay. What happens? If you know you're we're, we're like ten minutes into class and we've already gone through attendance and I've taken the quote down and someone comes in and sits down next to you and says, "What was the quote? What are you going to say?" Like today, you would say, "Like that's okay." Like I just want to know was a person here like today, you know? And then and 
you know, kind of the worst thing is, is that when, like when someone comes like a couple hours after class, hey, I was in class today, but I didn't make it in time for the quote. Tell me the quote. Yeah, I can, but the system's going to think that you weren't here, you know, for it. So please, you know, give the quote out. You know, don't email it to your friends. They got to be here, you know, to do it. Um, you know, and, you know, what if it's like five minutes before the end of class and someone comes in, hey, what's the quote? I'll leave that to your discretion. Should someone get credit for being here if they caught the last five minutes? I don't know. I don't know. You decide. Okay. Other questions? All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at variables. So this idea of a variable and it's, it's kind of fraternal twin, constant, uh, are basic fundamental ideas in the world of programming. And, um, you know, if you're already comfortable with variables in other languages, oh, I, you'll probably learn like a little bit more about how they're implemented in this discussion, but we're spending the whole day talking about the variables and the data types that are in DBA. So if I think about like the physical hardware of the computer, there is one place that I can store a value, uh, kind of have direct access to that value to be able to do some processing on it and let it hang around for a little while. And what is that place called? What, what do we call that place where I could store a value, let it sit around for a while and bring it back in and, and have kind of quick access to it? That is called, a little bit louder. My, my, my 54 year old ears aren't so good at this. So variable is not what the part of the hardware is called. We're talking about something in the hardware, yeah. So a hard drive is gonna be for like stable storage and we don't have really quick access to it. So the hard drive lets us hang around for a long time. Um, random access memory, yeah. And you know, what does random access memory look like? It looks like this, it's a little chip inside the computer where you can you know, put a value and then, and then call it back. And so um, we need some way to be able to easily put information into RAM and then call it back when we need it to be able to work on it. Now, this is like physical hardware, but logically what we're dealing with RAM is we're dealing with a series of ones and zeros. So everything in computer lingo has to be translated down to a series of ones and zeros, which are stored like long-term, like on a hard disk, they're stored, if it's spinning platter, they're stored as a positive or a negative charge, like magnetic media. If it's like an optical disk, it's like, uh, like either a divot or the absence of a divot in a place where a divot might be that we record this one or zero. Um, and ultimately this is what we have to work with, but this is not easy to work with. And so we have a thing called a variable that will make our lives a lot easier to work with this, uh, with this stuff. So here's what a variable is. A variable is a location in RAM, random access memory, with a name where a value of a particular type can be stored and retrieved. That's the idea. So it's, this, it's actually, it's a location in memory that has a name. And once I get that named location in memory, I don't have to worry about like the, the memory itself. I can just kind of think about it as the variable by the name that that variable has. Now, we're, even though we work with ones and zeros in the world of VBA, the smallest amount of memory that we will ever address is one byte at a time. So a byte is eight bits. What's a bit? A bit is just one of those ones or zeros, right? It's short for binary digit. It's just the one or a zero. So we're gonna work with the smallest amount we'll work with is a byte. So we'll talk about things in terms of bytes, just eight bits. Now, so here then is I've got you know, one byte of memory. And here's how I might store in that byte, the number zero. So my, my bits, let me get my laser pointer here. So each one of these then is a bit. And I've got just a bunch of zeros in here. Every, every single one of those bits is a zero. That's the number zero. That's the number one. I've got, you know, one in the ones column. You know, this one is what? Whoops, I guess I shouldn't have actually shown that number. That's two, because it says I've got the, I've got the bit that represents two turned on, and I've got the bit that represents one turned off. And so that is the value two, right? Maybe you've seen this in another, you've seen this in another form. There are, that number of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't, right? So what, how do you actually read this? There are two types of people in the world because that's how you say two in binary. Uh, I, uh, I, this is the one that I liked even better though. There are 
two types of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who have friends. So I don't know. So here now, so here's three, right? So this is, you know, I've got, I've got a two and I've got a one. You know, here's four. That's what four looks like if we're thinking about bits. Now we don't have to think about this in terms of the actual bits underlying, but I just want you to kind of understand what's going on. Is this gonna like show up on the midterm exam where I'm gonna give you a binary number and you gotta be able to convert it? No. Yeah, you're hoping, oh, please, <laughs> please. What's this one? 65, yeah. What is this one? I'm most surprised at how you know, someone can get this really fast. Someone say it, you know what it is, say it out loud. Yeah, 255, how did you do that so fast? You added up 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 69. You're good at this. Well, no, what's the next number in this series? If I was to say, you know, one, two, four, eight, uh, 64, 128, what's the next one? 256, right? And so the sum of everything to the right of that is gonna be one less than that because like when I click over to this, all the rest of these go to zero and I've gone up to the next number. So 256 would be the next one. Um, but if I only have one byte of memory allocated, can I, can I store the value 256 there? No, there's no room. The thing is full. You know, I, I can't turn one of these into a two because it can only be a one or a zero. And in fact, what would happen if I tried, and it's completely full of ones, what would happen if I tried to cram another one in there? What would it do if I had a cup that was completely full of some liquid and I tried to put a little bit more in, what would happen? Someone say it louder. It would overflow. Now watch this, you'll love this part. Let me, um, did I close Excel? I closed Excel. I had no business closing Excel. Why did I close Excel? Oh! There we go. Come back to me, Excel. Blank work. Alt F11, get to my Visual Basic uh, editor. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of do some examples here. I wouldn't, feel free to follow along if you want. Um, and I think I probably will go ahead and post this workbook with the examples that we do here. Now, we got introduced to VBA at the very end of last class. Oh, by the way, we introduced like a main idea in VBA that has two characteristics that we're interested in. Does anyone remember what, what it was that we introduced at the very end of last class? In VBA, we have lots of objects and the two characteristics about objects that we're interested in, one is called a property and the other one is called a method. A property is something that tells me how the object is, it describes how the object is. The, the method is something that the object does, knows how to do. Yeah, okay. Uh, but we just did that in the immediate window. The immediate window is ephemeral. Everything I put in the immediate window goes away when I close Excel. So if I wanna put VBA somewhere that sticks and becomes a part of the workbook, I have to put it inside a module. So here, I've got my brand new workbook here, book one. I'm in my, in my, my Visual Basic editor, which again, I could get there by choosing my developer tab and then uh, hitting Visual Basic or just pressing Alt F11 is the keystroke that will bring it up. That works, by the way, in Mac and Windows. Now, I've got a couple of modules that are built in here. There's actually a module built into the worksheet and to the workbook. We'll learn what to do with those later. We don't wanna play with those just yet. They're a little bit more complicated. Instead, I'm going to choose insert module. And that will give me a new object here that's just meant to hold VBA code. All right, now, I, gotta, I can't just kind of drop my code in here. I have to put it into like, I've got to group it together into a group of statements that will run together. And that's what's called a sub procedure. So I'm just gonna come in here and say the keyword sub, and then I'm gonna say oh, variable demo variable underscore demo. I'll hit enter. And it's gonna say, you probably want an opening and a closing parenthesis there. We'll learn what those are for later. You're gonna end this thing with an end sub. It did that automatically. It was so thoughtful. It put that in without me having to type it. And so now I can actually put some VBA code here that I can execute. It will get saved with this workbook. When I open the workbook again, the code will still be here. It'll be really nice. I forgot what I was doing. Oh, I was gonna declare a variable. Um, let me just do the dim x as byte. We're gonna see this in the, in the presentation here, but this is the smallest 
amount of memory that I can allocate. It's a, it's a, it's a data type, it says, by the way, everything has to get stored in memory as ones and zeros. But some of the data that we're gonna store there is a number. Some of the data that we store there is text. Some of the number data we store there's gonna be like a date or a time or you know, even other kinds of things. And so it all has to get written down to ones and zeros. And so by giving our variables a data type, we're telling VBA how to interpret those ones and zeros when it goes out and reads that stuff in memory. And so by giving it the type of byte here, I am telling it, hey, you are allowed, you're, you're, first of all, you're using one byte of memory and this is going to be only can store integers. And it has a range. We'll see what the range is here in just a second. In fact, the lowest number I can store is zero. So I can say X equals zero. And then I could print out the value of X. Now, this now, there's an object called debug. It's a debug object. It has a method called print. And when I call the print method of the debug object, it will just put whatever I tell it to print into the immediate window. So for instance, and I, and I could actually run that in the immediate window, debug.print hello, or hello. Okay, so it just prints whatever that is. Now, if I have a variable, it's not gonna print X, it's going to print the value that's stored in the variable X. And I've just put a zero there, so that should now print zero when I run this. Click on the little play button here and it prints zero. Um, I should be able to go up to, as we saw over here in the picture, I should be able to go up here to the biggest number that I can store in just one byte, which is 255. So I should be able to come in here and put 255 and run that again. And sure enough, I get 255. You know, so far so good. But what happens if I try to cram one more thing in there? If I try to go just to 256. What is it going to do? And the answer, whoops. And the answer is, I'm going to get error runtime, uh, runtime error number six. I got error number six. Like some of the error numbers we're going to get are like in the thousands. And this is number six. I feel pretty good about getting such an early one. But what's the text that goes with it? Overflow. I tried to cram something in there that wouldn't fit. And it actually prevented the memory from overflowing. What would happen if that byte overflowed, like one of those bits, like I put one more in here, that other bit would like pop right out and start rolling around inside my computer. I'd shake my computer, I hear all these bits rolling around or something. What's going on here? And so we don't want that to happen. And so the, the, the interpreter said, we're not gonna let you do that because that would be an overflow. That's a really bad error message. Couldn't they have done better? Yeah, but like this error message goes back to the 1970s. I'm not sure you could get better in the 1970s. So, um, yeah, so that's, so that's why there's a range. And so the range here is going to be integers from 0 to 255. So the, the range is there. The, the, the reason it's limited is because I've only allocated so much memory uh, to be able to use for it. What happens if I try to put something that's too small? What's that going to be? Maybe that's an underflow. Is that an underflow? I don't even know what an underflow is but it turns out the error that, that is is still an overflow. Overflow means you tried to put something into a variable that doesn't fit. And so we're just not gonna do it. Okay, how are we doing so far? Show me how comfortable you are on the stuff that we've covered on a scale of zero to five. Zero means you're at the moment, you're looking to drop the class and five means I totally got it, please move on. Okay, and I'm seeing some threes, but mostly fives. Okay, excellent. Okay. So there's 255. So now let's say now I've got two bytes instead of one byte. What if I got a variable type that has two bytes? What number am I showing here? Like if I double the amount of memory, does that double my range? No, every bit that I add doubles the range. Like so adding one more bit doubles the capacity here. So if we kind of looked at if we had these two bytes and that's you know the memory, how what, what number am I storing there? This is not a hard, I don't think this is a hard question. Yeah, 256, right? The, the 256 bit is the one that's, that's there. How about this one? 512 plus 256 plus, it looks like 1000. Boy, I'm so good at that math, having just reviewed these slides before class. Okay, so here's the first data type, it's byte. It's the one that we declared and saw that little example of, what an, of, of an overflow error. 
Uh, and so byte has that range zero to 255. Now there's a data type that allows me to do two bytes and that is called integer. For both of these, the only thing I put is an integer. What happens if I try to put in something that's not an integer? What happens if I try to put in 5.5? Any guesses? Some more self-respecting programming languages would give an error. It would be an overflow. You're trying to put something in here that doesn't fit. You have to understand something about VBA. They wrote this language. Um, well, they first they first rolled this language out in 1995, and it's rolled out to what platform? Excel. Yeah, and was it Windows 95? So it's, it's written for Excel. So it comes out into Excel in 1995, and it's meant for who? Is it meant for your computer science major? No. Who is it meant for? Knowing where the language shows up first, who is it meant for? Accountants, Excel users, people that use Excel. Would we say Excel users are would be you know typically more technical than it than a like someone whose job is a computer programmer or less technical? Probably less technical. So when they're making the language, they're making all kinds of decisions about what are we going to do under different under different circumstances. And part of the foundational philosophy of VBA is if my programmer tells me to do something that I can't do before giving up, I'm going to try to do my best to get close to what they wanted me to do. I'm going to guess at what they wanted and do that first. This should make you a little bit uneasy. Um, because if you tell a computer to do something that it can't do, probably best if it says, you know, I just can't do that. Um, I don't really want you to be guessing at what, especially if you're chat GPT. Listen, if you're going to be guessing at something that could like destroy the world, don't do that. Um, fortunately, VBA is not going to destroy the world. It might destroy your career, um, but it's going to guess. And so this is not going to be an error. What do you think that's going to print? It prints six. I can't do 5.5. What's the closest I can do? I could round it and then fit it in there. Okay, so that's that's just kind of something to realize. We're only, we're only thing that we're dealing with is numbers here. And so if we think about what's actually happening here uh, in memory. So what I have here marked with the gray background, so I'm saying that's memory that's currently allocated. So my operating system, in this case on this machine, it's Windows, it's Windows 10, um, says, all right, there's all this memory. And as the operating system, I'm in control of all that memory. Now, from time to time, I'm going to have a computer program ask me for some memory. Computer program says, hey, I need some memory to do something. And the operating system is all great. Here's some memory. And I'm going to make sure that you're the only one who has access to it. Uh, and in fact, you know, if another program tries to access memory that I've given you know, to this program, it's going to like, the operating system will terminate that program. It'll be a hard stop. It's like, you tried to do something evil. You tried to access memory that I didn't give to you. And I'm going to kill you for it. Um, and it really does. Now, it used to be in the early days of Windows before you guys were, probably before you were, can I really say before you were born? This is probably before you were born. What year? Who's someone who's kind of young in here? How, when were you born? Just someone say a year. You think you're young. Say the year you were born. Yeah, this is way before you were born. Um, well, it's a few years before you were born. Maybe the year 2000, maybe we're still having these problems. But in the early days of Windows, like Windows 3, which I think Windows 3.1 goes up to 1995. That's when Windows 95 was released, was replaced. Under Windows 3, also even under Windows 1995, or no, Windows 95, we would get a thing called a general protection fault. You'd be working along in your program, and then all of a sudden you would get an error that said GPF, and your program was dead. A general protection fault is when your program tries to allocate memory that it's not allowed to access, and the operating system just says you're dead. Um, I haven't seen a general protection fault in more than a decade. That's wonderful. That's really good news. Um, but what we have here then is we have this gray part. This is memory that has been allocated to some other program. So it's, it's allocated to some program. Now, um, each one of these ones and zeros has an address that points at that particular bit. Uh, and in fact, when you talk about you know, something being a 32-bit operating system or a 64-bit operating system. Have you heard those numbers? 
the, 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 the prime, that's not the only difference, but the main difference there, in fact, why it's called 32-bit or 64-bit, it's how many bits are used to address memory. So if you only have 32 bits in, to be able to say, ah, that identifies a particular location in memory, that identifies a particular location in memory, the most memory you can address is four gigabytes. If you have a 64-bit operating system, it's a lot, lot more. I don't know what it is, but but that was kind of the reason that we had to change is that we got computers now where it was like reasonable to have more than four gigabytes. I remember we had to go to a larger uh, addressing scheme to be able to get there. And so that bit right there has an address and we will typically think of that address in hexadecimal notation, which is base 16. So the, this is not really terribly important for us, but base in hexadecimal notation, the symbols you have to work with are zero through nine plus A through F. So you know, how do you represent 10 in base 16, it's the letter A. 11 is B, 12 is C, and it's just the different numbering scheme. It works out well, because it's a power of two, it works out well for representing um, memory addresses. Or I could represent that same address with a decimal address. It's just, you know, each one of these, one of these bits in memory is bit number one. One is bit number two, one is bit number three, and there's a lot of them. The very next one here is just the next number up. So instead of F0, it's F1. Instead of, you know, 448, it's 449. Now, if, if, if I ask in VBA, I ask the operating system, I need some more memory. I've got to make, make a variable. I need some memory. Dim x as an integer. By the way, how much memory am I asking the operating system to give me when, I, when this statement gets processed? How much memory am I asking for? Two bytes. Now, the operating system is going to find some place where it can fit two bytes, and it's going to have to avoid all of this gray stuff because that belongs to someone else. But the rest of the stuff is like currently unused. So it can find anywhere. It's going to pick somewhere. And it's going to go, great, here's two bytes. And you know that's got an address. And now what the operating system does is it says, oh, you know, I've, my VBA program is saying, hey, operating system needs some memory. And the operating system says, great, you need two bytes of memory. Here you go. And it says, these two bytes of memory belong to you. And it sends back the memory address of where those where those bytes start and says, you know, it's two bytes. So those bytes now belong to you. If some other computer program tries to access those, the, the operating system will very harshly say no. And you know, it's going to protect it to make sure that whatever number I put there doesn't get changed to something else by someone else later. Now, in the early days of programming, we used to have to think about where we're storing our memory based on like the physical location of that memory. And that doesn't work, that works okay if you're only ever running one program at a time. But can you imagine if you're saying, oh yeah, I'm talking about that two bytes of memory. What if I have two programs that are trying to access that same two bytes? That would be a problem. And so I don't really care where those two bytes are. I just need to know that I've got two bytes that I can work with. And so my VBA interpreter now is going to keep track of the fact that when I say X as an integer, it's saying, ah, oh, we're talking about accessing this location. So I don't have to think about the memory address. I only have to think about it by its nickname. Now, usually when we introduce variables to students, we introduce them by saying, you know, with some kind of a metaphor, imagine that you've got a bucket that has X written on the side of it, and you can put a value into that bucket and pull it out. Um, but if you don't understand what's actually happening, you'll get really, and we'll see some of these things in VBA, where you'll get behavior that is, really inexplicable, unless you understand that it's possible. I mean, that what we have here is, you know, we can have, it's, it's a location in memory. And in fact, it's possible for me to have two different variables that are pointing at the same location in memory. And when I change one, it automatically changes the other. We're not going to worry about that today, but that's, that's a possibility. Okay. So that has gotten us up to this idea of uh, you know, how an, a number is actually stored as a series of ones and zeros. So what do we have to do if we're going to store a negative value? So what happens is if I have a data type that can do a negative value, and by the way, byte cannot do a negative value, but let me go ahead and just make this example a little bit more descriptive. Here is, here's X, which is a byte variable. 
Let me also declare another one. Let me dim y, or let me dim i as an integer. i equals negative 10. And then I'm going to print y, which is an integer. And so that should now print these with some labels on them, which will be great. So uh, the debug i equals negative two. Oh, not y, it's i. I said I said y at first, and I thought I should call it i because it stands for integer. But now I've got my integer uh, as negative ten. So even though byte would have um, had an overflow if I tried to plug in. A negative number, the integer type handles it okay. Well, how does it do that? How do we actually get to a negative number? I mean, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. How do we get to a negative number? And so, you know, here is storing the value, like just looking at the integer portion that's stored, it's a thousand. But what the integer type does is it says, don't start counting at zero, start counting at negative 32,768. And then add on 1,000, because what I've stored there is 1,000. And so what's actually stored there is negative 31,768. Because it says, you know, you're storing some quantity there, but because this is an integer variable, when the VBA interpreter reads those bits out of memory, it says, okay, I see that the quantity 1,000 is stored there, but because this is an integer, I'm gonna start counting at negative 32,768. I'll add 1,000 onto it, and that's how I get this negative number. And so what is the smallest number that I can put in an integer, in an integer, a data type of integer? Yeah, negative 32,768. What would happen if I tried to put in negative 32,769? It'd overflow. It just, then there's no way for it to record it. And so that's why the data type is important. So, it, and so that the interpreter, the VBA interpreter, can know what to do with all the ones and zeros that it accesses when it says to the operating system, I'd like to see the, the data that's stored in that variable stored in that at that location. Okay, so here is the number 32,767 stored just as a value, right? Everything up to, but not quite to this one. So what number is that stored? Yeah, that's, that's starting there, adding that on to me, negative one, right? If we store the value 32,768, then that is zero. And then there's a thousand. So because this one particular bit here, if it's zero, the number is going to be negative. If it's one, it will be non-negative, either zero or positive. This is sometimes referred to as the sign bit. You could, you know, if you could look in and see what that uh, bit really was, you could tell if the number was negative or non-negative. Uh, I don't know that it's important to know that that thing is a sign bit. So if I store the value 65,535, if I store that quantity, what number is this if a data type is integer? It's positive 32,767. So the range is negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. Do I want you to know that for the midterm exam? No. What I want you to know for the midterm exam is that the integer type is roughly plus or minus 32,000. Not to be that precise, but you need to be able to know, you know what's the right data type to be able to pick for this. Now, how much memory do you have in your computer? How much memory is in that computer right there? Probably eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes. You don't have a laptop with more than 16 gigabytes in the room. How many, what do you got? You have, you have 60, you have 64 gigabytes in that computer. I don't know, I believe you, I believe you. I just want to gaze my eyes upon it. I don't think I've ever, what's that, what's that? Oh, you upgraded it. Yeah, beautiful. So I have 64 gigabytes on my desktop machine and room for more if I really needed it. I don't need it yet. Um, and that's a lot. <sighs> How much is a gigabyte? Oh, like it's a 1024 megabytes. Well, what's a man? What's 1024 kilobytes? Well, what's a kilobyte? It's 1024 bytes. Ah, we know what a byte is. So how big, how big is the full text of the Book of Mormon? You know how many how many bytes it is? It's about one and a half megabytes. So if you had just one gigabyte, 
With a little compression, you can fit it into one. So with one gigabyte, you could hold 1,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. Like the full text, with one gigabyte, you could have 1,000 copies of the Book of Mormon, the full text you know, could be stored in there. If you have 64 gigabytes, you've got 64,000 copies. How, how tall would that be? If you like stack them up, like the little one inch thick blue, 64,000, someone tell me how tall is 64, how many feet is 64,000 inches? Anyone did that for me? It's like 64,000 divided by 12. A mile. That would be a stack of Book of Mormons a mile high. That's a lot of data. Why do we care if I'm declaring a variable that is one byte or two bytes? I've got 6,400 million zillion bytes. And the truth is, you don't. You don't really care. Just make everything really big. Unless you're not making one variable at a time. What if you're making 100,000 variables at a time? I'm going to show you with one statement how you can make 100,000 variables. It's a structure called an array, and it's a really common thing to do. We'll learn it later in the semester, but it's because we can do things that eat up a lot of memory at a time. So I want you to understand what's the right data type to use for these different sizes. Okay, so the data types, uh, uh, the data type, that's integer. Okay, yeah, so basically plus or minus 32,000. So we have byte. 0 to 255, that one I want you to know, 0 to 255. We got integer plus or minus 32,000. The next one is called long, and it means long integer. So instead of two bytes, it's four bytes. What's the range? Like plus or minus 2 billion. So if you're, you're using a number, going to be you know not bigger than 2 billion, great. It's an integer, long would be a great one to use for that. And those are the types that... Those are like the integer data types. The truth is, once we got a 32 or a 64 bit version of Excel, they made one more type that's even longer than long. Can you guess what it's called? My favorite variable type. My favorite variable type of all. Is it just called extra long? <laughs> uh, let's just do this, not as integer, but as long. Uh, Let's dim L as long. L equals two billion, negative two billion. And this is long. Okay, so we'll see this working. And we won't do the full example of the next one just to. We'll just change the type so you can see it. So that's great. If I try to make that 3 billion, that should fail. We've got an overflow happening right there. But if I made this the data type called long, long, <laughs> that's really the name of the data type. Ah, no problem. Um, where I'm, I'm not going to expect you to know anything about long, long. Presumably, it's an eight-byte number. I don't even know what it is, but that's uh, you can go even longer. This is kind of the normal, uh, the normal range. Okay, and so those are the three integer data types I want you to know: byte, integer, and long. Now, how does VBA represent a decimal value? You got just ones and zeros. There's no decimal point. I can't just plug a decimal point in somewhere. How do we do it? There's a couple of approaches. One is called a fixed point number, where we say, listen, just divide an integer, and we're just going to know it's always to four digits of precision. So when I store a number like 65,535, if it's a fixed point number that has four digits of precision, then we divide that number by 10,000. We move the decimal place over four spaces. And even though I'm storing this integer here, then because it's this fixed point type of number, when the VBA interpreter reads that, it goes, ah, this is 6.5535. That's the value that we're after. Okay, so that's, it's just, we just have to say, hey, there's, there's always, four, always four digits of precision. Uh, and in fact, the data type that we have in VBA for that is called currency. 
So currency is rough, it's eight byte number, it's roughly plus or minus 922 billion. We're nowhere near, by the way, able to handle the national debt. It's a lot of bytes and we still can't handle the national debt. Um, but it's always stored with four digits of precision. Questions? That's probably the range of long, long, by the way, is just if that's not a decimal, it's just that, that whole set of numbers because that's an eight byte number. I'm assuming long, long is eight bytes. The other way that we could do it is what's referred to as a floating point number. So with a floating point number, what we do is we say, listen, we're gonna use part of this memory. Um, there is no two byte floating point number, but imagine that there was for this example. We're gonna say, listen, we're gonna use these four bits right here to keep track of where the decimal place is. And we'll use the rest of them to store an integer. So in this case, I have stored in all the rest of this 3,574. And I'm saying the decimal point is you know, zero. There are no digits past the decimal point. And so that really is 3,574. If I say, oh no, one digit's past the decimal point, then it's 35. 357.4, two digits past the decimal, three digits past the decimal point. Okay, so I'm using part of it to say how many digits are past the decimal point. And if I fill that up, then I've got you know uh, eight. That would be what 15 digits here. And so I could move that decimal point out 15 digits. That's like like the range that I could do. So I'm storing an integer, and then I'm just saying that decimal point goes somewhere. Where does it go in all? So here's the two types of floating point numbers that we have. One is called single, and it means single precision floating point number. It's a four byte number, and so that's the range, but I'm only significant to seven digits. If I get seven digits, significant, but I can push that decimal point either way off to the left or way off to the right. And so I can do really, really big numbers, but I can't do really, really big precise numbers. I can do really, really precise numbers, but they can't be really big. So, well, I can make really, really small numbers, like even to like, you know, fractions of a number. But again, I've only got seven significant digits. Similarly, there's a double precision floating point number and it's eight bytes and that's the range. That's a big number. But you only have 15 digits of precision. So 15 digits, you can actually say the number, but then you can push the decimal place either way in a big way. Questions on this one? Uh, as it turns out, the actual implementation of single and double is a little bit more complex than this. Um, it's beyond what we're gonna try to do in this course. Once you give you the idea of a floating point number, even though the implementation is just a bit, a bit different. Okay, another data type that we have does true or false. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to store a zero or we're going to store a negative one. Uh, and so zero means false, negative one means true. The truth is zero means false, any other number means true in VBA. So, but we actually have a data type that deals with that. For no good reason, it allocates two bytes for this. It could do it with one byte. It doesn't do anything less than a byte, but it all actually allocates two bytes. And so that's how we store one as if this were a, a, an integer variable. And that's how we, I'm sorry, that's how we store zero. So that's false. And that's how we store one. So it's really, you can just kind of think of, well, anyway, I don't know how to think of it, but the data type is called Boolean, named after George Boole, who was a 17th, 17th, 18th century mathematician who thought a lot about logical values. Did you remember having to like memorize truth tables when you were in like uh, pre-algebra? True and true is true, true or true is true, false or false is false, false or true is true. Um, you have George Boole to, to thank for those exercises. And so it's called Boolean. So you would declare a variable as Boolean. Let's go ahead and do this one. Dim B as Boolean. You say B equals true. Print out B. Okay. 
and it's Boolean. Boolean. Um, by the way, if I put in 22 here, what will it do? Yeah, that's true. Like anything that's not zero is true. Put in zero, that should be false. Okay, questions? It's gripping. How about a date? How do we represent a date? Uh, and the answer is we're going to store a number. Uh, we're going to store a number. Just be an integer. That is a number of days either before or after this starting date, which is a great day to start, December thirtieth, eighteen ninety nine. Who decides to start counting the dates at December thirtieth, eighteen ninety nine? I don't know, but that's it. So if we were to make a variable of type date, dim d as a date. And then we were to say D equals zero and then print D. Oh. And it actually, we use dates for dates and time. So let's do one instead. Because it's trying to guess. If it's saying if you're date zero, you're probably only interested in the time. So let's try that again with date one instead. And so with date one, one day after the index date, it goes, oh, yeah, you're talking about 1231-1899. That's the day you're interested in. Why didn't they start at 1900? My guess is they meant to. Like someone made a mistake. And just ended up sticking. So day two is. Oh, whoops, I meant to say two. Yeah, day two is January 1st, 1900. Okay, so, you know, if we're storing this number, 27,945, then that's going to be 27,945 days after December 30th, 1899. which if you know something about me, what would you guess? Something to do with the 4th of July, probably. The bicentennial year, 1976. I was alive during the bicentennial year. Ah. So how about a date and a time? So now it's not just the number of days, but it's the number of days or portions of a day. So you know, we'll store a number like, Two two seven nine five eight point three seven five, and that gets us three seven five three three hundred seventy five thousandths into the day or nine a.m. So the date type then takes eight bytes, and that's your range. Maybe that's why the range is where it is because it starts at January first one hundred goes all the way up to December 31st, the year 999. Ah, oh, the name then is different. So, so, so far, everything we've done has been de dealing with numbers. How do we get to dealing with letters? The answer is each character is going to be mapped to a number between 0 and 255. So we're going to use one byte to represent each letter. So if I represent, ah, uh, yeah, this is the number 65. That happens to be capital A. What's capital B? Oops, I thought that was the next slide. Capital B is 66, capital C is 67. So I'm just gonna kind of turn that 65 on its side so we get a little bit more. But now we could kind of store John Adams as a string using one byte for every character. And then we're saying here, 65 is capital A, 100 is lowercase d. The comma is its own character, that's 44. The space is its own character. That's 32. In fact, everything less than 32 is non-printable. So it's a character like a carriage return. If you remember, did you ever watch like you know, some kind of old movie where you've got someone in a newsroom and you kind of hear like typewriters going crazy in the background? It's like the, the newsroom just sounds like, have you heard? Anyone seen a movie like this? Okay, so some of you have seen something like this. So, you know, what are those machines? Those machines are like 
correspondents from outside the newsroom are like sending in news stories. And what are they doing? They're connecting up to a telephone line and they are sending a sound that gets interpreted as a 65 and the teletype machine on the other, on the, uh, you know, in the newsroom, you know, says, ah, strike an A onto the paper, strike a B onto the paper, strike a C onto the paper. When it gets to the end of the line, what does it do? It needs to know to move the print head back to start again. And so it sends character number 13, non-printable, which says, move the print head back, move the print head back. It sends character number 12, or 11, which, I'm sorry, 10, it's 10 and 13. Character number 10 that says, advance the paper. And so it's actually, you know, these numbers come from this idea of saying we need to be able to not just store electronic data, but it's, you know, comes from this idea of like remote controlling a device that prints. So the first three, two characters are like tab and ring the bell. Like you ever been on a like manual typewriter? You type for a while and then it rings, ding. How many of you have ever typed on a manual typewriter? Wow, like about one fifth of you, yeah. And what does that ding say? You better hit return soon or you're gonna run off the edge of the paper, right? And so there's actually, you know, something for a bell as well. I wonder if I can actually, it's number, it's character number eight, by the way. I wonder if I could just print character number eight. So I could print character number 65. And that will be capital A. So CHR is a function that just takes the number, the numeric representation of a number and gives you the, the alphabetic one. Character number eight. Think it'll ring? I don't think it's gonna ring. Oh. It doesn't, know, doesn't, know, doesn't know what to do with character eight. So it gives us this little yeah. box here. That's probably what it does with character number seven as well. But I bet it doesn't do it with character number nine. Character number nine, it knows because that's the tab character. Right? So if you think about like remote controlling a manual typewriter, you know, some signal that says tab, like strike the tab key, and we deal with, we still use tabs all the time. There's actually a statement in VBA to beep. It's called beep. I'm still not entirely sure we're going to hear it. Oh, oh no, it's an error. Oh, it worked. Expected a function or variable. Maybe it's not beep. I don't know. Anyway, so this then is how we would actually store, you know, in ones and zeros, how we would store like a string of characters like John Adams. Now, all the data types we've talked about up to this one are fixed length data types. Like when I declare the variable, it knows eight bytes. This is going to be, you know, this is going to be a, a, a variable of type currency. Eight bytes get allocated for it. And you just can't put any more uh, into it. And, and if you put a small number, it doesn't save any bytes. You know, could you store some numbers in less than eight bytes? Oh yeah, lots of numbers you can store with less than eight bytes. But as soon as I declare the variable of that type, that's how much memory gets allocated. Those are fixed length variable types. String, which is what we're using here, is a variable length data type, which means how much memory gets used depends on what I put into it. And so, oh, here's the ASCII table, by the way, which shows kind of how these all map. Right? Oh, seven was the, eight was the backspace. Seven was the bell. Did we try seven? I think we tried seven as well. Yeah, nine is the tab. Uh, 11 is, uh, 10 is the line feed, advance the paper. 12 is, uh, now, 13 is the carriage return, send the print head back, so forth. And then, you know, here's your capital A, here's your lowercase, and so forth. Um, so this, because it's a variable length type, there's some overhead involved with this variable. So we have four bytes that are allocated just to tell us how long, how much memory is actually allocated. So when I first declare a variable of type string, it allocates eight bytes, it allocates four bytes, and it says, it puts in there zero. There are no characters in this string. So it takes four bytes just to be able to say there are no characters. So there's always four bytes. So in this case, we've got 11 characters in the string. And so we're using our first four bytes to store the value 11, right? Eight plus two plus one, that's 11. So this says, the first part says there's, a, there's 11 characters. And then, so when my, my VBA interpreter is reading this variable, it says, ah, this is a string variable. And it knows the address where the variable starts. And so it says, hey, operating system, give me the next four bytes that start at this starting address, and it will send back this data. The VBA interpreter then goes, okay, now I need to read the next 11 bytes. And so we'll ask for the next 11 bytes, and it will get in all of these ones and zeros. It'll convert them you know, into, the, into the numbers, the characters that we see here. Well, that's how we actually end up storing character data. Questions?
Okay, so for those of you who would, who would have said, yeah, I'm already really comfortable working with variables. Kind of the more detail that I've given you so far, show me on a scale of zero to five, how interesting it's been. Zero was like, I totally knew this. Did I have to come to class today? And you know, five was all, wow, I never knew how that was working. So just if you, I'm seeing some threes, some twos, some fives. There's a few of you who are saying, yeah, this is pretty good stuff. Okay, just curious. I want to know how badly I'm abusing my experience programmers here. So data type then is string and you know, kind of the same thing while well, allocating, you know, some memory here. Now, so when I dim name as string, the, the op I, I have asked, my interpreter asks the operator, he says, I need four bytes of RAM. And it says, great, here's four bytes of RAM. And then immediately my interpreter is going to put, fill that with zeros. So you can see how we've got zeros filled out in all of these right here. It says that there's zero byte, there's zero characters in this string. Now I'm gonna say that variable equals John Adams. Now, what would be great is if it would just go, great, put John Adams in here, but will John Adams fit here? No, because look, just one more byte ahead and we run into memory that's already allocated. So what happens when I actually put a value into that string? It goes, oh yeah, we're gonna have to find a new place that's got now 11 plus four, 15 consecutive bytes and then we'll allocate that memory for it. And so every time I change the value of a string variable, it actually has to go find a new place in memory to do it. Is that important? It might be important because if you do some kind of process that says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going through something trying to figure out what this string should be. Uh, I'll add the next character onto it and then I'll add the next character onto it, add the next character onto it. That actually takes quite a bit of time to do because each time you have to rewrite the whole string to a different location in memory. We'll talk about that when we get to dealing with strings. In case you're really, in case you really want to do this sometime, come down here and figure out the first 32 bits, the first eight or four bytes, and you'll find out that really does say 11, and then do the next 14, and you'll find out it really does say John Adams or Adams comma space John. Ah, I had a great time making that slide. Okay, let's talk about another data type. So. Um, another data type is called object. Now, remember, we've learned what objects are. Objects are things. Objects have methods. Objects have properties. The properties of an object are just variables that are built into the object. And so I've got an object, and it could have, you could hold several different values. Each one of those properties is a value. And so each one of those properties is a variable that's built into the object. And so I'm gonna think about this object, a particular object range A2. And it's got these five, these five properties. Actually, every range has dozens of properties. I just wanna kind of look at these, at these five properties. So this object is a complex thing. And it says, all right, I've, um, I've got these attributes. I've got these properties. I've got an address, a formula that's in that cell that has a value. It's got a column that it's in and a row that it's in. And there are literally dozens of other properties that that range has. And so objects are these complex things where I'm gonna take you know, several variables and kind of, kind of collect them together. So I'd say these are somehow associated with each other. I don't just wanna make them like independent variables. I want them to be part of this object. So they're grouped together. But we can create an object variable like this. So we can say dim range as object. So let me just go ahead and I'm gonna do that one here as well. Dim R as object. And let me do this one here. I'll just do this at the top so we don't have to scroll down so far to see it. R equals range. A2. Now, as it turns out, I have just done something here that's a little bit problematic for Excel. Let me go put something in A2 here. And what the good folks who wrote this language said, you know what, if someone says they want to print range A2, what should, what should we do? What should we do 
if the user tells us, oh, by the way, the question mark is just shorthand for saying print. So I guess it's the same as saying print or even debug.print. Question mark is just shorthand. If I execute that statement, what should it do? What would you expect to be printed? So don't be shy. If you get it wrong, it's not going to hurt. I'd be surprised if you get it right. What would you want it to print? You'd want it to print high there. You're saying, listen, how many properties does this thing have? Uh, it's got an add indent address, address local, allow edit, application. Which of all these properties should we choose? We can't print them all. Some of them are not printable, like the application, the application property, that's Excel itself. You don't want to print Excel here. That'd be terrible. Uh, and, so, and so when you do this, it goes, you know what? It probably means the value. I bet they just mean the value. I bet it's just the value. And they guess at the property. And so if I just refer to a range without saying what property, it's going to think I mean the value property. Now, the problem is right down here, that's not what I mean. I don't mean set, the, I, don't, I don't want to set R equal to the, the value of range A2. I want to bind the variable R onto A2. I actually want this to refer to that range. And so what I have to do is come here and say the word set in front of it. What they're saying here is they're saying, listen, We've got all these accountants using Excel, and 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 uh, uh, who can I disparage? And we've got some humanities majors using Excel for who knows what. And we don't want them to have to think about objects and properties. Like if they can figure out they're talking about range A two, well, let's call it good. Let's not make them think they've got to say A two dot value. And so they're thinking for beginning users, we want to have this idea of a default property. But if you're trying to use an object variable where you're binding a variable onto an object, you're, that's pretty serious stuff. You know, we're going to require you to know something a little more advanced. So instead of just setting that variable equal to the object, you're going to have to use the keyword set. And so set just says, don't use the default property. I'm really talking about binding a variable onto the object itself. So now, when I do that, now R refers to that particular object. Let's do this. Instead of specifically A2, let me set it equal to the active cell. And now let me debug.print. This is uh, R, which is an object. And I'm going to print R.address. So what happens is this now becomes a way to refer to another way to refer to that particular object. So right now the active cell is A2. And if I run this, it should print the address A2. Or if I move it over here and run this, it's gonna be what, C6. Now, but the interesting thing is, let me do this. Let me say range A1 dot select. I'm going to call in the select method of range A1. What will that do? Yeah, that will make A1 become the active cell. And now the question is, when I print this again, what will it print? So I've said R is going to be the active cell. So Whatever cell is active, that's what it's going to print here. But I'm going to activate a different cell. What's it going to print now? There are two options. It's either going to print C6 or it's going to print A1. Let's vote. Who says C6? Who says, no, no, A1? Ooh, A1 is more popular. I don't remember. Let's take it. Let's find out. It printed C6 both times. And the reason is, is that when I execute this, it says, all right, listen, that, that object is somewhere in memory. That object, that whole object structure is somewhere in memory. Wherever that is, we are going to bind the variable R onto that. R is literally going to hold that memory address. And so later when the active cell changes, that's just fine. 
R is still holding the memory address of the object that it was bound onto. And so this variable RNG then literally just holds the memory address of some other range. So how much memory is allocated when I make an object variable? Just enough memory to hold a memory address. So to be able to point somewhere else. And so if I've got a 64 bit operating system, what's 64 divided by eight? I think it's eight. I get eight bytes of memory allocated and it's just all it's doing is saying, hey, I'm keeping track of where some other object is. Now, the truth is, you know, I could, it could take me a really long way to refer to some other uh, range. Let's say I've got some workbook. So out of all the workbooks, I've got a workbook called um, daily data.xlsx. On that, I've got a sheet called um, prices. On that, I've got a cell, a range. V44. Like that, if I'm if I'm referring to a, a, a range that's on a different workbook, that's what it takes to get to it. Wouldn't it be great if I could say, you know what, just set R equal to that. And then later in my code, when I refer to that same cell, R gets me to that same cell. Okay, that's the whole point of using an object variable. Now, uh, what else do we have here? Variant. One more thing here, and that is I don't have to declare this as object. I can declare it as range. If I make it a range, that's a kind of object. Now the only kind of variable that R is allowed to hook up to is a range object. If I try to hook up range to a worksheet object or a workbook object or a chart object, it'll just say, no, you can't do it. It can only go to a range. Okay, we've got two more slides. So there's this other type called variant. Variant can do anything. You treat it like a, a string, it behaves like a string. You treat it like an integer, it behaves like an integer. You treat it like a date, it behaves like a date. You treat it like an object, it behaves like an object. The cost is 22 bytes of overhead. So 22 bytes get allocated just to keep track of what you're doing with it. And then depending on what you're doing with it, it will, it will take you know more. So you store a large number, it'll take you know eight. You store a big string, it'll take 22 plus the size of the string and so forth. Um, and so you might think, well, great, let's just use variant. Why don't you just give, start with this slide and we'll use variant for everything. After all, I've got 64 gigabytes of memory. Well, I care if I got extra 22 being used you know, on this variable. And the answer is, is that there, is a, there are a lot of assumptions that VBA has to make when it's using data type variant. And the, you don't know what those assumptions are. And they will, they will take you down the wrong road until you're really comfortable with this stuff. So you want to avoid variant because it's going to, it's, VBA is going to guess and it's not going to guess in intuitive ways. Okay, the last part of this slide then, I think that's the last one, yeah. It's just, you know, what do I expect you to know for the midterm? This is the slide I want you to be familiar with with the midterm. So these are the data types. What do I want you to know about it? Because this is, because understanding this is going to make you a better programmer in VBA if you go, okay, I know the data type to use for, for making this variable. Oh, oh, we got to talk about constants too. A constant is exactly the same thing as a variable, except it gets its value when it's declared and you can never change it. I do know a variable is I allocate memory. I can put things into it, put things out of it, pull things out of it. A constant, I allocate the memory, it gets a value and it can't change after that. All right, thanks for coming. See you, oh, do I see you next week? I won't see you next week. Yes. I'll see you the week after next, class dismissed.